online on our YouTube page um, here in the coming days. So with that, treat pests and problems. All right, so quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, first, we'll kind of go over what 2021 brought us and the implications uh, moving forward into 2022, some pests and problems I expect to see in 2022, and just some long-term tips and tricks for uh, survival of your trees, both freshly planted and um, the older ones that you already have on your landscape. So what happened in 2021? Uh, thinking back, we had a lot of drought stress. So what this led to is a lot of stem girdling roots were very obvious to us. And what I'm referring to is this bottom right hand picture here. Um, that trunk goes right into the ground and that's usually indicative of something going on with the roots below the ground. But we'll get more into that on the following slides. Um, oak wilt as usual is always an issue here in uh, Sherburne County uh, with our sandy soils and our high density of red oaks. Um, it's just kind of always going to always has been an issue and always will continue to be an issue in the future. Um, pine bark beetle, um, that is especially bad during drought years. So as expected in 2021, we saw a high um, concentration of that. Um, general oak decline um, in the white oak group, we saw a, a lot of that. And then kind of the, the silver lining to all this is because it was so dry, there are very few fungal related issues. The most common one that we, we typically see in you know more wet years is called uh, rhizosphere needle cast. And all of these topics that we saw in 2021, I expect to see in 2022. So we'll be covering all of them here, you know, in the, the following slides. So first up, I just talked about it, stem girdling roots. So, you know, what is a stem girdling root? So stem girdling roots are roots that encircle the main trunk and then cut off the flow of water and nutrients up and down and throughout the tree. So we can compare this to, you know, putting a human in a chokehold. Uh, we're cutting the oxygen off and it's the exact same concept. Instead of oxygen for humans, it's nutrients and water for uh, trees. So the species that I see this happen to the most is actually maples. That is completely anecdotal. There's no, um, you know, evidence to back that up. Just uh, my own observations here in Sherburne County. So some of the symptoms of this, what, what you can look for in your own landscape and what I'm looking for is we're looking for that trunk to go straight into the ground. So here on that last side, it goes straight into the ground. There's no flare of any sort. Um, and that's usually indicative of a stem girdling root. You can compare that to this one right here. It flares out, you know, it's almost a foot away from the tree, you know, as it's entering the ground. Um, another thing we look for is circling roots. So in this picture, you can see it's actually moving around. Um, and in this picture, it's going to be just below the soil. You can see they excavated a little bit up here, but um, if you just dig down a little bit, you can see there, you know, it's not just one root, it's numerous that are kind of making this circular pattern. So not only can you see things below the ground, but you also start to see things above the ground. So what we're looking for is a dead canopy, but it's not random branches throughout. It's actually the center of the canopy that will die first, and then it kind of works its way outward. Um, but once that center's dead, it's really obvious. It's quite an eyesore. And at that point, you're kind of left with two options. If you catch it before it's too late, and if it's a, a, a small root that's encircling, you can sometimes cut it. Like in this picture, I've seen uh, probably 50-50 on whether that works or not. Um, it, you're, once that, that center part of that tree is dead, whether you remove that encircling root or not, it will never you know, be brought back to life. So typically, if you're gonna try to uh, remove that girdling root, it has to be pretty early on. It's probably gonna be in more of a case like this where you can see it versus an underground, um, but still you're severing a root. It's, it's not you know, the, the most non-invasive practice to, to do to a tree. So, the other option is to remove and replace. And that's typically what I see um, a lot more of, of what people do. So some of the reasons that these happen um, is because of poor planting, whether you plant it too deep or too shallow. And then sometimes it's just the, the nursery stock that you get. So those, those trees that you get from the nursery, they're in the, the big black uh, containers or they're bald and burlap. And, and roots have a bit of a memory. So if you have roots that are already circling the pot, 
And then you take it out, you, you mess up that root ball, you spread those roots, you put them out straight. Well, sometimes they still will just keep circling. So the U of M has created a technique called box cutting, where you essentially turn your, your circular root ball and then you square off the edges, remove an inch or two from each side. And it's, it's kind of scary to do. You know, you're cutting a lot of roots off, you're, you're removing a lot of soil, but they've, they've shown a 97% survival rate and it, it does a great job of preventing these, um, these encircling roots. So if you're going to be planting a new tree, uh, check that out, give me a call, let me know if you need any more information. But that's a great way to prevent, you know, stem girdling roots so that you actually get a tree, you know, 15 years down the line versus having to remove it and restart. So moving on, rhizosphere needle cast disease was something we didn't see a lot in 2021 due to the drought, but um, what it is, is it's a fungus that impacts uh, spruce needles or sp spruce trees needles. Um, it's spread through the wind and air droplets. So th through the wind and water droplets. So once it's in an area, it's quite difficult to completely remove and eradicate. Um, and also, you know, it's very easy to spread. So a, a, a spruce tree, a healthy spruce tree will hold anywhere from three to five years worth of, of needles. And then when they put, and then they put out new growth every year. So as you can see in this picture, there's, here's that, that new growth that I'm talking about. However, when rhizosphera infects a tree, it only kills the older needles. So you'll be lucky to get one or two years worth of needles where you used to see five. So you can see again in this picture, these tips are green and then everything else is dead. So it's still connected at this point. This picture was more than likely taken in the spring. Um, and then over the course of the summer, um, all of those needles will fall off and then start to look more like this tree. So what are the symptoms? A thinning canopy, uh, that's the biggest one. And then if during the spring, you can uh, see these actual, these are the spores, the fruiting bodies of the, the fungus. Typically you need a, a little hand lens to see them, or if you have you know, cheaters, that, that works too. They're, they're just big, just small enough that you can't see them with the naked eye, but you don't need much help. Um, but once they're there, they're very difficult to get rid of. So again, symptoms, thinning canopy, dead needles. Um, as far as treatment goes, there is a fungicide that works at um, killing the fungus that's currently present. It is not a preventative, it is simply a treatment. And due to the, the longer reproductive life cycle of rhizosphera, it's a three-year treatment. You have to cover the entirety of the tree with this fungicide and you have to do that twice in the spring. So that's a total of six treatments. Um, it could go longer than that and it's kind of spendy. So biggest thing we can do is prevent it in the first place. So that kind of leads to some cultural practices. We want to increase the airflow around and throughout the tree. So if you have a, a, a wooden, you know, a, a fence of trees, a fence, um, a line of spruce trees, and they're really tightly packed together, all the branches are growing into each other, well, you're not getting much airflow through there. So you might have to remove every other tree or do some pruning and trimming as necessary to increase that airflow throughout the system. What that's doing, what's that, what that's doing is increasing the, the speed at which um, water droplets dry. So there's just gonna be less spread um, and then it's just going to be less of an environment for fungus to proliferate and uh, reproduce. And then if you're planting new spruce trees, you're trying to create that, that fence aspect, um, plant resistant species. So white spruce is our native spruce that um, I think it's described as very resistant um, versus the Norway spruce is coming from Norway and that's highly resistant to it. So one of those two options is your, your best choice. Um, but then the other, the, the biggest thing you can do, especially in um, more of an urban setting is to keep any sprinklers off. So if you're watering, um, keep those sprinklers off, off the trees, off the needles, because that's just increasing the, the frequency that, you know, that it's a wet environment that fungus can thrive in and survive in and then reproduce, so. Things to remember, keep your sprinklers off, increase airflow, and then plant healthy species. Additionally, 
um, Colorado blue spruce are especially susceptible to rhizosphera. So if you have one of those, it's definitely recommended to take some um, preventative measures so that you don't have to deal with this in the future. So I gave you the quick overview of 2021, covered a couple that I expect to see in 2022 as well. Um, and now let's go over a couple more here in 2022. So oak decline, oak wilt, two-line chestnut borer, pine bark beetle, and emerald ash borer. And then after that, um, I think you guys will probably have enough information that, that you can uh, make some good decisions out on your properties. So oak decline, um, it's not so much of a formal disease, you know, like rhizosphere, where it's a singular fungus that's, that's causing this issue. But when we talk about uh, oak decline, we're, we're talking about a combination of problems that are leading to this, this general decline. So we're, we're talking about just the white oak group in this, in this scenario. Uh, we're going to leave oak wilt and the red oaks. We're going to talk about that separately. Um, so how to differentiate between a red oak and a white oak. Um, the white oak has these uh, rounded lobes, rounded tips, versus a red oak will have uh, pointed tips. So if you have pointed tips, you're going to have a slightly different set of issues versus if you have rounded tips. So the white oak group includes burr and white oaks. Um, and yeah, let's talk about some causes. So the major causes previously in 2021 of this oak decline were contributed to drought damage, two-line chestnut borer, and potentially oak wood. Burr oak blight is a disease that's caused, uh, it's a fungal disease. So with high amounts of water, um, it causes, you know, some drooping, some wilting, and some early leaf loss. So last year that wasn't part of the, the, the problem, but drought absolutely was. And then two-line chestnut borer was. And oak wilt is something that we are currently studying in the white oak species. It's very well documented and studied in the red oaks, uh, just due to the speed that it kills, kills the trees. However, in white oaks, it can take anywhere from three to five to seven, maybe even 10 years to actually kill the tree. So to get a positive diagnosis on a white oak um, of oak wilt is very difficult to, um, very difficult to do without actually sending a sample into a lab. And, you know, that, that costs money in order to send a sample into the lab, you have to take a currently wilting branch. And because oak wilt typically will start at the top of the tree, work its way down, that's usually quite difficult to, uh, to gather that sample while it's in the current wilting stage. So kind of some symptoms of this oak decline, wilting, early leaf loss, and then dead branches in the upper canopy. So, you know, it doesn't seem like too positive of an outlook. So what can you do? Um, well, a lot of it kind of depended upon when that tree was planted. If that tree is on a poor site, um, there's not a whole lot you can do, unfortunately. So if it's, you know, you're, you have a tree planted right near your house, only a half to a quarter of the roots are receiving um, water because, you know, there's a house on the other side of those roots. Or if they're, you know, you're driving underneath the tree, there's compaction on the soil. Um, it's a drought year. You know, there's a number of factors that go into it that's causing this tree stress. So the biggest thing you can do is prevent stress. So um, that includes watering when necessary. If your tree is in an urban setting like this, where there's tons and tons of, you know, Kentucky bluegrass around it, um, just a simple sprinkler will not get water down to the roots. So you're going to need to soak the ground a little bit more. Um, an easy way to do that, take a five gallon bucket, drill a little hole in and, you know, fill that up three or four times and just let it slowly release all around the root area here. So you can assume roots um, go all the way to the tips of the branches and that's your, your, your root zone. So when you're watering a tree, you don't want to just put it at the base and, you know, leave it for 15 minutes. That's great. It's, you know, doing a great service to the tree. However, you can spread that out 15 minutes here, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes at the base that's gonna be so much more beneficial to the tree. It's just gonna be that much uh, more effective at actually watering the roots uh, fully and just getting as much water into the tree itself versus just onto the, onto the grass. So moving on to oak wilt, 
in, in this section, we're gonna be just talking about the, the red oaks. Um, but what oak wilt is, is it's a fungal pathogen that you know, primarily affects the red oaks. However, you know, as I talked about, we are seeing it in the white oaks, but the effects are a lot less prominent and a lot um, slower to cause tree mortality. Because in the, in the red oaks, we can see tree mortality, so tree death, you know, in a little, as little as four weeks, three weeks, sometimes even, um, if, if the conditions are just right or I suppose just wrong. But um, the, the main re way that oak wilt is spread is actually below ground. But in order to get to a stand of oaks that's, you know, that, that below ground spread can start, we need to, to spread it through the air. So it's not just in the air, like rhizosphere, like we were talking about, but it's actually on a sap feeding beetle. So these beetles are attracted to the smell of a fresh oak wound. So they sense that um, and then they go and feed on it. And on, on their bellies is this fungus, and that's how it spreads. It's not the actual beetles that are, are killing these trees. It's, it's the, the fungal, you know, the fungal pathogen that's it's on their bellies, but then they go introduced to that oak wound. So only about 10% of the spread is actually through these beetles, but they contribute to 100% of the new infections that we found. So 90%, of the new or of the infections, once it's in an area, is completely underground. So what happens is that when oaks are growing near each other, they'll actually graft their roots together. So they'll grow together, and that way they're able to you know to share water and nutrients, and it's beneficial to the entire stand. However, now that we have oak wilt, it actually can be quite harmful because all it takes is one tree to get infected. And then it slowly spreads that disease outwards um, from that original infection and infects all of the trees that are, are connected to it. So uh, some of the symptoms that you're, you're looking for, especially if you have oaks on your property that you're concerned about, um, if, you have, if you just have one, you know, that, that's more of a prevention. But if you, if you have a, a number, you're going to want to look for these symptoms and look regularly. Otherwise, you can have a massive problem and it's just, it's very hard to get under control once, once it gets out of hand. So look for this wilting from the top and outer portions of the tree, progressing inwards and downwards. And then if you, you're finding leaves on the ground, what you're looking for is these outsides of the leaves will turn brown and then work their way in, but you'll still kind of keep that, that little bit of green there in the center. And then again, tree mortality in as little as four weeks. So, you know, that kind of seems quite doom and gloom. So what, what can you do? Uh, well, prevent it. So what this looks like is not doing any pruning, any cutting, any work around near uh, weed whips, nothing like that during the, the months of April through about July, um, the end of July. Those are the absolute worst months to be doing any sort of uh, work on oaks. If you need to do oak work during the summer, after you know August to October, it's considered the safer period. So it's about a moderate risk versus that April through you know the end of July is the high risk period. So and then you know August through October is the, the medium risk. But then if you really want to do some serious work, pruning, I recommend leaving all that until November, anytime November through March. So we're just starting to enter that high risk period. With the current weather we've been having, you're probably safe if you gotta do one or two, you know, quick things out there. But I wouldn't, you know, go out and start a week long project. We're, we're really getting, we're getting close to that, um, that high risk period. If you're kind of on the edge like we are right now, feel free to check the, the DNR website. If you Google Oak Wilt DNR, they have a, a, a status update. So it'll tell you high, medium, or low risk. And that's a great way if you're, you're uncertain to just do a quick double check so you're not, um, you're not, not bringing oak wilt into your, into your property. Um, otherwise, um, there are chemicals um, that can prevent oak wilt symptoms from showing. So it will not prevent oak wilt infection, but it will prevent it from killing your tree. However, this is something that you have to have the tree has to be currently moving these chemicals through it before it becomes infected. 
Otherwise, uh, it, it's a preventative, it's not a treatment. Um, once, once oak wilt's there, especially in these red oaks, it, it moves so quickly and so aggressively that the chemicals just can't keep up. But if the chemical's there already, then it will protect, um, protect the tree. However, these are, are very expensive treatments. Um, you have to repeat the treatment every two years. And the larger the tree, the more chemical you got to use. So uh, bear that in mind if you plan to treat any of your trees with chemicals. Um, it's a continued cost and it can add up quite quickly. And then like I was talking about earlier, the majority of the spread is below ground. So how do we, how do we prevent that? And the way we do so is with a vibratory plow. So that's what this picture is right here. Um, you essentially drive through and sever all the root grafts. This is about a five foot blade and they're hoping that 99% of the roots are within that zero to five foot range. And then you can cut all of the, the roots. So I'll quick kind of explain to you what that means. So if we, if we go up here and we just lay out our, our sample forest here, each one of those little marks will count as a red oak. If this tree right here becomes infected, um, oak wilt roots will typically spread about 60 to 90 feet um, to the nearest tree. So we can assume this tree was within 60 feet, this tree was in, within 60 feet, and the rest of these are kind of outside of that zone. Um, so what does that mean? Well, we'll come through with a vibratory plow. We would exclude this tree at a bare minimum. However, Oak wilt moves quickly, so even if these trees, these trees are not seeing any symptoms, we can kind of assume that the roots are grafted. It's more than likely moved there, um, but it's just not proliferated quite yet. This is a stressed out tree. It's a great host, so it's just going to hang out here for a while. But you know, maybe maybe it's here, maybe it's here. We're not entirely sure. So we're going to come back through and do a secondary line secondary cut, I'm gonna sever all the roots. So hopefully it didn't make it here, but in case it did, it's not gonna to continue to spread to the rest of your trees. Um, that's kind of what a vibratory plow looks like. That's kind of what they'll do out there if you have someone come out and do it. And then this is good for about five to seven years before they regraft. So if you have oaks um, and you do detect oak wilt on your property, do not, just go out and say, oh, I'm going to cut this tree down and then oak wilt's going to be gone. No, it's even if that, that tree is, is dead or dying, just because you remove the tree, it's still underground, it's still in the roots. And actually removing that, that upper part of the tree will actually force it to spread that much more quickly um, because the host is now gone. So it needs to go find a new one. So there's a number of strategies to deal with oak wilt. Um, However, there's no simple injection just to solve all of our problems. So if you have it, it's better to take early and aggressive action versus waiting um, for, for nature to take its course, unless that's really your only option. Uh, moving on to two-line chestnut borer, another one of those uh, factors I mentioned in oak decline. So two-line chestnut borer is Similar to emerald ash borer in the way it um, affects trees, we'll be talking about emerald ash borer as well, but uh, two-line chestnut borer is actually a native beetle, um, and it will attack almost all of the species of tree in Minnesota, although I most commonly see it um, in the oaks, um, white oaks especially. Um, they're, you know, they're very similar to ash borer, as I said, um, but the two-line chestnut borer will, will, will lay its eggs underneath the bark. Um, mostly in the upper canopy. Um, so it's very difficult to spot right away. And then it, it lays its eggs underneath the bark, the eggs hatch underneath the bark, and the larvae will live and eat the phloem tissue. And that, this is tissue um, found throughout the tree and just the outside, the last maybe quarter inch of bark. And this tissue is responsible for moving water and nutrients throughout the tree. So what happens is these beetles create little tunneling feeding galleries and slowly 
over time um, with a large infection, these beetles will eat all of that tissue on a branch, which then causes, you know, it's the same thing we were talking about with the stem, stem girdling roots. They girdle that branch, which then causes branch death. So an infection like this is not very severe um, currently. However, you can see it's starting to spread. And that's when you want to take action. This is still an actionable tree versus a tree over here. That, that tree, you're not going to be able to save too much. You'd be able to save just the stuff that's green. But once it's dead, you're, you're not able to get it back. So some of the symptoms that um, are those yellowing leaves and dieback starting at the top of the tree kind of sounds familiar, to, similar to oak wilt. So again, uh, this is a, a very difficult um, diagnosis, and it's quite easy, easily confused. Because even when these, these larvae do finally hatch and exit the, exit the tree, um, the, this, this is the two-line chestnut borer. It will fly around for you know about a month, but it feeds in the upper canopy. Um, and really, it's, it's um, kind of very difficult to see. I've seen one in my entire career, um, and it literally just flew into my car window and landed on my hand. So I wasn't actively looking for it. I was putting you know the directions in Google. So totally um, unlikely that you're ever going to see one of these. However, there is a chance you will see the damage. So as far as treatment, um, the biggest thing you can do is prevention. So like I've said before, um, diseases and pests seem to attack stressed out trees. So again, if you can prevent that stress, um, you're going to minimize the chance of you having a two-line chestnut borer infection. And then if you do start to see symptoms of it and you know, you get a, you're pretty confident with your, your uh, diagnosis, whether that's me, another professional that comes out and does it, uh, then, you know, there are pesticide options that are very effective at controlling this. Um, with the caveat being, you should probably contact um, a professional. Um, there are certain, you know, there, there's soil drip options. So they're going to put granules in your soil and then the tree is going to absorb that. There's root injections where they actually kind of take a needle and inject it along the, the, the root flare. Or there's uh, foliar applications where they essentially spray the leaves and the bark. Um, so depending on your situation, um, they'll pick the best choice for you that, that fits the needs of that tree. So moving along, we'll talk about uh, pine bark beetle. It has a very similar uh, way of killing trees as um, the two-line chestnut borer, as we just talked about. But again, these are native engraver beetles that infest red and jack pine, red pines and jack pines, and they can Rarely, but every once in a while, you find a, a white pine or a spruce tree that's infected with these. However, it's not quite the same severity, and it's usually not an issue. So these beetles, they um, like to attack stress trees again. You know, that seems to be a common theme that we're talking about. Or they'll attack uh, freshly cut pine trees. So, you know, a healthy tree uh, should not be harmed, and trees that have been dead for over a year are, they, they do not act as a breeding ground. So once that wood's dried out, it's no longer um, a source of concern. So some reasons that we have, you know, stress, especially in red pines, we see a lot of plantations or they're, you know, they're heavily planted along roadways. Um, some of the reasons that we get stress, especially in those is drought, obviously, but then um, competition. So what we're referring to with that is, you know, whether it's shrubs or brush or, you know, buckthorn especially, or if it's just, you know, the red pines were planted at eight feet, um, eight feet apart, and it should have been 10 or 12 feet. Um, that, that extra competition, well, you know, they're competing for light, they're competing for water and nutrients and all that. So each tree is not as strong as if you were to remove a couple to increase that, that bigger. Um, also, in our pine plantations, we'll see wind damage a lot, um, and those wind damage has been documented to um, be a kind of a stimulus for a lot of uh, bark beetle damage. Uh, it's also been documented, unfortunately, that uh, there have been large population booms following years of extreme drought. So 2022 might be a big year for pine bark beetle. So what you're looking for, if you suspect that you have pine bark beetle, is a dead or dying red pine or jack pine. 
um, yellowing to red slash brown needles up in the upper canopy, and then small a sixteenth of an inch uh, holes on the trunk. Once you can see these holes at eye level, your tree is more than likely dead. These uh, beetles start at the top and work their way down, similarly to the things we previously talked about. So your best bet is to get out a pair of binoculars and, and look up as far as you can. But I mean, these, these holes are tiny. It's, it looks like on a heavily infested tree, you know, someone took a shotgun and shot the tree with bird shot. That's how small they are. And that's how prevalent they are in an infected tree. And I mean, I can look out my window. I see that there, there was a row of five pine trees going, and now there's only two. And, you know, they, they, the stumps got cut a foot and a half off the ground, and I can go out there and find, you know, these, these little holes. So obviously there was an infection. Obviously it was bad. So what, what is there to do? Well, as far as chemicals, chemicals are not your best option again. Um, you need to spray a pesticide that on, you have to cover the entirety of the tree with a pesticide twice in the beginning of the, the spring. And timing is extremely important. So you have to catch it when the beetles have just came out of the bark, but before they've laid their eggs. So you have about a three day window, you have to treat the tree twice. So on a mature tree, this it's just not realistic to do. So our, our second option is a trap tree. And what a trap tree is, is a tree that you've selected. It has good sunlight. Um, it, it's, it's right in that stand of infected trees. And what you do is you, you slowly kill that tree over the course of the summer. So you girdle the outside bark, um, not super deeply and aggressively, but you get it so that tree is going to start releasing pheromones where it's you know, it's shouting out, I'm, I'm stressed, I'm dying, I need help. And what that does is it attracts these beetles because they are attracted to that stressed and dying tree. And they'll go in, the, the hope is that they go in, they lay all their legs, the beetles then die. And over the course of that summer, all of the, the beetles that exited the tree um, from the previous year have gone and laid their eggs in this one single tree. Then come that following, that, that current fall, uh, you cut this tree down and dispose of the wood. So disposal, either burn it, bury it, chip it, or if you want to use it, um, you know, and you, you can't remove it from the site, pile it up and then cover it with a tarp and make sure you bury all the edges of that tarp. Do not um, leave this wood underneath your trees. Otherwise, you're just, you're just, you know, leaving it there to be infected in the following year. Um, also, try not to do any pine work um, cutting during the growing season um, because when you, whether it's pruning or cutting down, um, it's, it's just that, that, that stressed environment is being created again. And it's just very um, ill-advised um, if you're trying to prevent bark beetles. So um, if there's any husbands out there, this is your excuse to not work on your, your pines this summer um, and save it, till, save it till it gets cold again here in the fall and in the winter. Um, next up, we have emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is very similar to a two-line two -line chestnut borer. However, the caveat being is that we have not positively identified um, emerald ash borer in Sherburne County yet. So we have that, we have that going for us. Um, the nearest infections would be um, in Anoka and in Clearwater, and then even just there in Otsego, right across the river from Elk River. So it, it's kind of starting to form a, a horseshoe all around us. So talking to the people at the, the Minnesota Department of Ag, um, it's more than likely in our county. It's just not quite at a high enough density yet for us to notice. It takes anywhere from, you know, three to five years of being infected in a tree for us to actually notice. So that's both a positive and that it's a little bit slower move than, you know, we're talking with the oak wilt where trees are dying in four weeks. However, because it's slower moving, it can be a lot more difficult to, um, to observe, you know, right away and catch it early versus um, the infection kind of carrying on. So here at the SWCD, we do um, yearly woodpecker uh, damage monitoring. So 
one of the simplest ways or one of the most major symptoms um, to identify Emerald Ash Borer is this, this woodpecker flecking. So as you can see, we have this light colored bark and this dark colored bark. And the light colored bark is actually where um, woodpeckers have gone. They can actually feel the, the larvae underneath through their, their claws. Uh, it's amazing, they can sense that vibration and then they just uh, peck in and uh, pull the grubs out and eat them. So to differentiate um, uh, just regular woodpecker damage versus ash damage, um, you're gonna see a lot more damage and they're not gonna be deep holes. They're only about an inch in diameter and then they really only go down maybe a quarter of an inch. So you're not even gonna be able to see that that hole from the ground. You know, if it's a, a deep hole um, and it's large, it's more than likely not emerald ash borer. There's more than likely a, a different issue that's attracting that uh, woodpecker. But again, some symptoms, this woodpecker damage, this time of year, that's the biggest thing you can look for. But uh, come summer and kind of late spring, summer into the fall, what we're looking for is these, this thinning canopy, typically the well, always the, the emerald ash borer will start at the top, work its way down. So you'll typically see that the top part of the canopy will thin out first. And sometimes you'll see this huge, massive flush of just green leaves here. It looks like this part of the tree is doing great. What's really happening is, well, we can't get any of these nutrients up to the top. So we're going to get them as far as we can and then just kind of go, go crazy. However, the following year, this area is usually dead. And then you'll see more of these stems sprout. So, excuse me, all of those in conjunction are um, a great sign that uh, you have emerald ash borer. Um, as you can see, quite, quite small. Um, I myself have never seen an actual beetle alive, um, only, you know, in test tubes of alcohol. Uh, but they're very, very difficult to actually see. And as far as the exit hole goes, you know, it's extremely tiny and it's going to be up in the, in the canopy of your tree. So uh, this picture here is, I thought was pretty interesting. You can see right when the larvae um, initially uh, hatches and then as it grows, it gets quite a bit larger. And this S-shaped gallery pattern um, is distinct to um, the emerald ash borer. There is no native borer that will do this um, S-shaped pattern. A lot of them are a lot more, you know, kind of windy and they'll twist in on themselves and go all over. So if you think your tree has emerald ash borer and, you know, there's a little bark split um, and you see it, this S-shaped pattern, that is very indicative of emerald ash borer. So treatment. Have a lot of doom and gloom treatment for you on the chemical side of things. However, with emerald ash borer, there's a lot of positive, there, you know, there's a very positive outlook. Um, if your tree is too far gone, I would say this tree is too far gone. Once you lose about 40 to 50% of the canopy, it's not worth um, treating. However, there is a pesticide treatment that will prevent the infection of new um, emerald ash borers. Um, the, the larvae that are currently in the tree will be killed. Um, and this treatment is effective for two years, and then it must be repeated. So over the course of 20 to 30 years, the treatment costs will equal out to the removal cost. Um, emerald ash borer treatments, you're looking at about seven to $10 per diameter inch of that tree. So if you have a, a 10 inch diameter tree, looking at anywhere from 70 to hundred dollars, which, you know, it's, it's pretty manageable if you have a couple trees. However, if you have a lot of trees in a woodland, that is not an option. And that's where you're looking at a remove and replace. So with ash trees, they are very brittle when they dry out and they dry out very quickly. So if you have an ash tree that you suspect is infected with emerald ash borer, it's better to take that tree down while there still is, you know, a little green left on it. Um, those limbs are just that much more springy. Um, and if it's a large tree, um, companies once it's completely dead, um, if it's an ash tree, it completely dies. You got to call out a company to come cut it down. They will not send a climber up into the tree um, just because of how brittle the wood is. So it's going to be more, um, more equipment. You know, they're probably going to have to get a bucket truck in there. So that typically will increase your, your cost. So 
if you do run into this problem in the future, um, it's better to address it um, sooner than later. And if you want to treat your trees, if you want to prevent emerald ash borer, it's again better to start that treatment before any infection is present. So I'll give you an example here. Um, in Elk River, all of the um, trees that they have deemed um, worth saving for the next 30, 40 years, they have begun their treatment program. So every two years, they're going through and treating their trees. Um, they have a lot of trees to treat. So they have that split in half. So one year, they'll do half the trees. And the following year, they'll do the other half. This is a great way to, for them to spread out their costs. And it's something, if you have a lot of trees that you're committed to saving, it's something that you can do as well just to, to spread out that cost. And then the other, the other kind of positive note, what we'll end on here with Emerald Ash Borer is that, that two-year treatment that they currently have, um, they're working that towards more of a three-year treatment. So every instead of every two years, every three years. And depending on the chemical you get, depending on the professional you, you have to, to conduct that treatment, they'll let you know the frequency um, that you need to uh, retreat. But if you're ever looking for a third opinion, um, an outside party, um, feel free to give me a call and discuss what um, you're being told. If you, something doesn't sound right, I'm more than happy to to hear what what you're telling you what they're telling you and um, just give you an outside opinion so we covered a lot of diseases a lot of pests so what what can you do to maintain the long-term survival of your tree so first off a young versus an established tree an established tree it doesn't take too much work make sure it's getting you know about an inch of water a week and then keeping the weed whips off the, the base of the tree as much as you can. A little bit of mulch around the base is great. Um, if you don't like the look of mulch just around the base of your tree, you know, you prefer more of a, a grass um, appearance, I would recommend um, doing mulch anyway. I know I just said you probably didn't like that, but then you can fill it with native plants. So if you're, if you're looking for native plants, we are offering our native plant sale. Um, they are live on our website until April 18th, I think I have written down here. Um, but that's a great way to both help the pollinators, but also um, kind of add some beauty so you're not just looking at a, a, you know, a patch of mulch. Um, it's going to bring pollinators and other beneficial insects in that will both help your tree and kind of the environment in general. So um, to go along with mulching, um, you have to make sure there is no stone, no plastic um, underneath that mulch um, or replacing stone with mulch. Um, that stone is a great heat conductor and it really does a great job of drying out the soil underneath the tree. Um, so we try to have as little stone as possible, but then when you are adding mulch, kind of try to create this, this mulch donut shape where the, the majority of the mulch is outside here and then it's all pulled back from away from the, the, the trunk of the tree. This just helps prevent any uh, fungal issues that can be started. You know, how many times do you, you go out in nature and you see little, little mushrooms growing right at the base? That's what you're, what you're trying to prevent here by pulling that, that mulch away. And then realistically, when you're mulching, you want the mulch all the way to the, the tips of the leaves. That's, that's, the amount of space that you want to be mulched. Now, you've got a big tree, that's a lot of mulch. That's not realistic. So as, as put as much as you can, um, as much as you think looks nice, and then you know, try to incorporate some plants when you can. Um, that's the biggest thing is the, the mulch is most important on the younger trees. And as they get older, it's not quite as necessary. However, if you can incorporate some native plants and other things in, that does a, a great job of just giving you uh, multiple benefits. So uh, moving on to fertilizer, should you fertilize your tree? Um, well, that's a bit complicated. Um, without doing a soil test, you really can't determine should you or should you not fertilize it. Um, a mature tree will not need fertilizer um, unless a, a problem has been documented. Um, if you're, you're seeing yellowing at the tips of your leaves or you know the leaves are smaller than usual then you're, you're probably looking at um, a, uh, a nutrient deficiency but if your, your tree is doing fine it's it seems to be putting out new growth every year you probably don't need it and some of these 
fungal diseases, um, if you add a nitrogen or a high nitrogen fertilizer, it actually speeds up the the, the growth of the fungus, and it's 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 like a, just like steroids for that fungus. So sometimes adding fertilizer can be quite negative to your tree. And then with fertilizer um, comes the need for watering. Um, in order for that fertilizer to kind of to be available for trees, and when trees use the fertilizer, um, it's they need a lot of water. So if you if you decide my tree does need fertilizer, make sure you're getting it extra water, um, you know, for that, that entire growing season because a lot of these fertilizers or the fertilizers that you should be using are these slow release. Um, and it's instead of just, you know, like a lawn fertilizer, you throw it out, you water, water your lawn, and then it kind of seeps in and gets absorbed. These slow release fertilizers are, are meant to last the entirety of the growing season. So you have to give extra water to that tree for the entirety of the growing season. So just keep that in mind um, when you are, are adding anything like that whether it's to your garden or, or to your trees. So um, another thing to do is protect, it, protect young trees against animals. So that's as simple as adding you know, a tree tube like this. It prevents um, rodents from eating away at the base and hopefully prevents deer from, from scraping up the trees. Um, but you know, those deer, they'll find a way if they want to. Um, and then pruning, removing suckers like this. That's a great way to increase the vigor of your tree. Um, these suckers are just like their name, like their name state. They're they're sucking the nutrients away. Um, instead of going up, they're going right here and pumping out energy, whereas the rest of that tree could really use all of that energy. So, and, and I guess to go into pruning, not only are you going, do you want to remove the suckers? but you want to remove weak branch unions. So when you're, you're looking for a healthy branch union, you want it to be U-shaped. Um, and when they're, when they're a tight V-shape, that typically means that there's some bark inside underneath um, the bark that you can currently see. And it, it grows around it and creates a weak, weak spot in that union. So you don't necessarily need to prune that out immediately, but you need to recognize that this might be a spot to uh, that the tree will fail in the future. So that's something to keep an eye on. And if, if that branch is a branch that can be removed, it's better to remove that, you know, proactively versus, you know, to come back after a heavy windstorm or a heavy, heavy snow event and have that be broken off because that's just a, that's a, a great opportunity for uh, pests to come and find that and introduce uh, more diseases. So, with that, um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Otherwise, um, this is my contact information. If you have questions later this summer, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out. David, it looks like there's one question in the chat, but it might've been kind of covered when you were just talking about um, watering. Um, how much water should we give a tree at a time? Is it, um, is sh are shorter periods of water more times beneficial or longer um, periods beneficial? Sure. Um, so longer, more of a, a soak is what you want versus just, um, you know, spraying it on the top for that short. So what you want is that, that long, you know, 15 minutes slowly around the tree um, versus, an, an irrigation system um, that you know every other day puts on enough to you know keep your grass green. Um, that those are actually not very beneficial to uh, trees at all um, in ground irrigation, and in some cases they can be quite harmful. Um, the the biggest thing if you have in ground irrigation is to keep that um, that sprinkler off of your tree, um, whether it's needles and pines and spruce, um, keep it off the needles especially, and then as little contact as possible with trunks, um, both coniferous and deciduous. And that's just to prevent uh, fungal issues. So what you're looking to do when you when you do water your trees is to have that that slow uh, soak, um, you know, 15 minutes in a spot, um, and then kind of move your hose, um, if that's how you're doing it, or we talked about a five gallon bucket with a hole, kind of move that around and, and do that for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. 
um, and allow, allow the water to actually get down versus, you know, just be absorbed by the water. Because, you know, a lot of our, our yard grass, that's, that's going to, you know, intercept almost 90% of the water if we're just spraying it on top. And then only, you know, 10% actually gets down to the roots. But when you're soaking it, you know, that, that, that top grass will absorb as much as it can. And then the water's finally able to, to make its way down. So slow and steady does win the race, uh, especially when you're, when you're watering trees. Are we able to call your office and someone would come out and um, look at our trees? I mean, we have blue spruce in the front. And now that I listen to this, I think it maybe they have that one disease that you talked about because there seems like they're dead in the inside. Mm -hmm. and they, have, they have needles on the outside. Are you guys able to come out and look and then see what you think and give us some ideas of what to plant instead? Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah, you can feel free to call me at that number. That will ring directly to me. And I am the, I'm the guy that will come on out and take a look and we can chat about your situation and what the, the best steps moving forward would be. Okay. Thank um, you. I, I'll have to say you're going to have to call me tomorrow. I won't be answering my, uh, my phone after this. <laughs> well, if there's uh, no more questions, we can wrap this up. And uh, sounds like I'll be getting a call from you, Sherry, tomorrow. And um, you guys can have a good evening. All right. Thanks thank for, you for uh, joining us. Thanks, David.